does John Gibson really want out of Anaheim and should the Devils pursue him? And also, let's talk about Alexander Holtz and its future with the Devils organization. We have a lot to talk about in today's episode of Locked on Devils. Buckle up, everybody. Your Locked on Devils, your daily podcast on the New Jersey Devils. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi, this is Bryce Salvador, and you're Locked On Devils with Trey Matthews. Elias scores! Oh, Steven stepped up, nailed him. Rodor has got the puck. What a shot. The Devils win the Stanley Cup. All righty now, what is up, New Jersey? Welcome back to the Locked On Devils podcast here on Locked On Network. I'm your host, college hockey play by play announcer. Dell's Ride for Pucks and Pitchforks, and also part-time credential Mia member, Trey Matthews. Like I said in the cold open, I have a silly season discussion to share on today's episode. Apparently, there's another goalie out in Anaheim that possibly wants out of his current situation. We're going to talk more about that in segment two and three of today's episode. But to start off, I want to talk about Alexander Holtz and his future with the Devils organization. Now, why am I touching on this subject, you might be asking? Well, a few days ago, Ryan Novozinski of NJ.com, he's a friend of the show, he recently released an article discussing an exit interview that he had with the front office at the conclusion of the season. And I read the article, I found it quite compelling, and I want to talk about it on today's show because, once again, we talk about how stacked the top six unit is for the Devils, but you still need a couple fillers, and I think there is a position open for Holtz, but he's going to have to go out and prove it. But time is winding down. It, it Time is not his friend in this case because I think the front office is uh, losing their patience in terms of his development because on the one hand, he's good in the AHL, but on the other hand, when he gets to the NHL, it's very uneventful. So we're going to talk about that in segment one. So to begin, I talked about the exit interview that Holtz had with the front office. So according to Ryan Novozinski, to start off his article, he basically painted a picture as to what the scenario was. So as you guys know, during exit interviews, the players talk with the media. And that's basically your last chance to ask a player a question or reflect on the season. But during those exit interviews with the media, the, the players also have an exit interview personally with Tom Fitzgerald and company, basically to give their thoughts on the regular season, give their thoughts on the coaching staff, and basically talk about some potential changes that need to be made with the organization and Possibly that's a chance for the star players to express either their frustration or their praise with how things are going. So just to give you guys sort of that scenario. So Holtz, as you guys know, did not speak with the media during exit interviews, but he did have a personal meeting with Tom Fitzgerald. But according to Ryan Ovozinski, once more, it wasn't just Tom Fitzgerald present for that interview. Lindy Ruff was there. Dan McKinnon, who is the assistant general manager, was also there and head coach of the Utica Comets. Kevin Deneen was also present and Novo had the chance to speak with uh, McKinnon on the matter. And uh, McKinnon was quoted to say the exit interview was really interesting and an important one. It was direct and firm in terms of the messaging. It first came from Lindy, then Fitzy. They said that this is a potentially a career defining off season, at least the early part of his career. You have to be ready to play as you've ever been both physically conditioning wise, but also mentally committing to this type of responsible play that Lindy's going to need from him to be in the lineup on a day-to-day -day basis. So what does that quote mean? Well, Novo touched on it in his article, but my thoughts on the matter is that they're basically telling Holtz that this is your last opportunity because when we look at the roster and how things are currently constructed, there are a couple opening spots for Holtz to possibly take, but he's going to have to earn it. So I think what these people are trying to tell Holtz is that if you do not step up your game, you're either going to be a healthy scratch or you're going to be dealt away. And this goes back to during the regular season, which I was actually surprised that Holtz was not included in the trade package for Timo Meyer because I was like, I think the San Jose Sharks, given uh, Holtz's past relationship with William Eklund, I thought that maybe Holtz would be the bare minimum as to what needed to be included in the package. But after the trade deadline, Holtz was still on the roster. I was like, okay, this could still work out. Things could still be uh, repaired, but it's going to take some time. But basically, the front office and everyone is telling Holtz that he needs to step up his game now. Otherwise, his future with the organization might look a little murky. So let's talk about Holtz as a player, and then I'll get to his future with the organization. So like I just said minutes ago, the thing about Holtz is that he's an interesting case because when he's in the AHL, 
he performs really well when he's performing in his native home of Sweden, when he's representing them on a national scale, he performs really well. But when he gets to the NHL, he's like a deer in headlights. He, it feels like he has like a plates of concrete on his skates. He's very slow and he's not as effective. So the numbers don't lie. This past season with the Utica Comets, he appeared in 14 games. He had six goals, five assists for a grand total of 11 points. He appeared in 19 games for the Devils this season and he had three goals and he had one assist, but finished off the year with four points. So very lackluster performance in a decent sizable games for Holtz, because once again, the Devils, unfortunately, they for Holtz, it's just like they were very successful this year and he just fell out of favoritism. I'll touch on that matter in, in a few moments as well. But let's go back to last season, because I think this really speaks volume as to how well Holtz performs in different leagues, because for the Utica Comets, once again, while in the AHL, he appeared in 52 games, 26 goals, 25 assists, 51 points. While representing Sweden for the international juniors, appeared in three games, he had two goals, two assists, grand total, four points. Last year for the Devils, nine games, two assists, two points. That's it. So the thing about Alexander Holtz is that the reason why I'm sure the Devils are still hung up on him is that he's able to perform well while representing Sweden. He's performing really well in Utica, so you just latch on to that hope that maybe it could translate into the NHL. But the problem is he can't remain in Utica forever. He's going to have to step up his game. So obviously his first season with the Devils, in which he only appeared in nine games, that's not a decent, sizable uh, advantage for Holtz because unfortunately he's given such limited amount of games to showcase what he could do. It's his first time playing in the NHL, so it's just like, okay, we can let that one slide. But this past year, 19 games, and he was a part of when the Devils were winning games way more consistently. I think he was a part of that 13-game win streak because the Devils were dealing with some injuries, particularly with Andre Palat. 19 games, I get it. That's not the most sizable, but it's still a decent amount of games where you can assess Holtz because, like Fitzgerald said, usually you can gauge a player and their overall projection after 20 or so games. So Holtz was only able to rack up four points. And when looking at Holtz as a player, what does he bring to the roster? Well, when he was first drafted, a lot of people compared him to Philip Forsberg. Now, Forsberg, similar to Holtz, is both Swedish. He's an alternate captain for the Nashville Predators. He's racked up a lot of points. He's also a winger. So people were saying, like, maybe Holtz can develop into a Forsberg-type player. So, And the numbers don't lie. While in Utica or with Sweden, Holtz is a very good player with a lot of upside but the problem is, how does that translate into the NHL? Well, Jesper Bratt did reveal that he is training with Holtz, that they're trying to get his skating abilities up to par. And what hasn't gone Holtz's way? Well, I just said that the success of the Devils, unfortunately, Holtz fell victim to that because now the Devils go from a rebuilding team to now a contending team. And I just said their top six unit is stacked. So there's not really much room for him on the top six, but he's going to have to showcase what he could do on the bottom six in possibly a limited amount of minutes because he's not going to be playing those top line minutes. And he now he goes from being one of the centerpieces during a rebuild and possibly giving the Devils organization some hope to now becoming an afterthought because now we see the surgeons of Jack Hughes, Nico Keisher, Jesper Bratt, all those guys. You add Timo Meyer, you add Tyler Toffoli, Dawson Mercer has also taken a couple steps forward. And Mercer and Holtz were drafted in the same draft. So it's just like, why are we seeing this surgeons from Mercer, but not Holtz? That's also a big question that needs to be taken into consideration because I'm sure that's what the front office is also thinking about. So unfortunately for Holtz, it's just like the devil's success and the fact that their organization just went from rebuild to now contending. Obviously, it does put them into a peculiar situation, but it's still not a big enough excuse because like I just said, he can't remain in Utica forever. He's going to have to take that step forward or show glimpses that he's capable of playing at the NHL level. And I get that the style of hockey for the Devils is a little bit different and unique because as we know, the Devils love to run and gun. They love to play that East-West style type of hockey. They like to tire out their opponents and they like to do those stretch passes to get onto the open breakaway. And unfortunately, for Holtz, I, I guess this is where the system just doesn't fall into his favor because I don't know how the Utica Comets run their system, but it might be a little different compared to the Devils. And the same can be said when he's representing Sweden on the national scale because maybe they play a different style of hockey. So I guess just the style of play 
fits better for someone like Mercer compared to Holtz. So my thing for Holtz is that he does need to get a skating coach because unfortunately he is a little slow out there. And I get that might hinder him a little bit and that he, he he's just unfortunately not playing in the right system. But still, you got to be adaptable. Part of being a good player is that you got to adapt to a system very quickly. And that's why the front office had this exit interview with them, this crowded exit interview, because they're basically telling it to him straight, which is if he does not step up his game, he's going to be dealt away or he's going to be a healthy scratch. So when looking at the line combinations, according to Daily Faceoff, there are a couple openings for Alexander Holtz to slide into because Tyler Toffoli is most likely taking Thomas Tatar's position on the top six. Obviously, Miles Wood is no longer on the team. That opens up a spot, but I project for Curtis Lazar to fill in that role. And then Yegor Sharangovich is no longer on the roster. So I think that's a spot that Alexander Holtz can slide into. And daily faceoff, their line combinations are projecting for Holtz to be on the third line with Eric Holler running the center and Andre Pilat at the left wing. So my thing for Holtz is that, yes, you don't have to light the league on fire. You don't have to, like, be on Dawson Mercer's level quite yet. But you do need to showcase some glimpses of that you can potentially play at the NHL level and put up some consistent numbers. And that's the thing that I think the front office is trying to get to him. Because my thing for Holtz is that I am opening to trading him away, but for the right price and the right pieces. So I said, don't in include him in any Connor Hellebuck discussions because that doesn't make sense. Why would you trade away a, a prospect that can definitely develop into something special and for a maybe a one-year rental or why would you trade Alexander Holtz to get a first round draft pick? That doesn't make sense because now you're starting back to square one. So my thing is like, uh, if you're going to trade Holtz away, trade him for a player that is going to remain with the devil's organization for quite some time and is a impact player right away. So for Holtz, I am open to trading him away once more, but for the right price. But for the most part, I think he definitely deserves maybe a bigger chance with the devil's organization, but he definitely, definitely needs to step up his game. So that's my thought on Alexander Holtz and his future with the team, which is it's looking a little murky. And yes, I, I, it's not the ideal circumstance I think he foresaw himself in, but you got to be adaptable and you got to be worked with what's given. So that's my two cent opinion on Holtz and his future. And I found that article by Ryan Ovazinski very compelling. He does great work. So if you want to hear Novo's thoughts on the matter, the link to that article will be in the description and you can be the judge for yourself. And I still think Holtz has a position on this team, but similar to what Dan McKinnon was alluded to, to saying in his quote, he's got to step up his game now because this is possibly his last chance to showcase something because he can't remain in Utica forever. And the Devils, they're fast moving right now, both on the rink and in the front office, which is they want to win now and they have no problem dealing you away for some sort of package deal so that way they can get that impactful player right away. So we're going to talk about a silly season situation involving John Gibson momentarily. But first, let me tell you guys about FanDuel. So take your first swing at betting MLB.com FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. That's right, just 20 bucks, and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's $200 you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over and under to who you think is going to be the uh, first player to hit a home run during a game. All on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel official partner of Major League Baseball. Okay, so let's talk about a silly season discussion. And I was actually meaning to do this uh, discussion last year, but never got around to it. But I, I'm glad I waited till now to do this because there might be some trouble with the Mighty Ducks organization because it's rumored that John Gibson has asked for a trade. And according to Frank Saravelli, he was quoted to say, I am not playing another game for the Anaheim Ducks. Now, this tweet caused some controversy because KO Sports, which is, I guess, the company that represents Gibson, they went out to say the Nasty Knuckles podcast episode was released with an inaccurate report by Frank Saravelli that John Gibson of the Anaheim Ducks had stated he refused to play another game for the Ducks. On behalf of and at the request of my client, John Gibson, we would like to clearly state that this statement is false and unjust, inflammatory, 
Frank Saravelli did not reach out to the player nor myself to the fact check the accuracy of the comment. My client has never stated to any member of the Ducks front office in any such statement. John Gibson is honored to be a member of the Anaheim Ducks and is continued supporter of its fan base as well as the Ducks community. And this statement was released by Kurt Overhart, who is in charge of KO Sports and once again represents John Gibson. Now, Frank Saravelli responded to the tweet and he said, hey, Kurt, do you remember the last time you attempted to claim my reporting was false? And basically he shared the story in which Saravelli was saying that uh, David Ludwig had accepted a role with the Arizona Coyotes organization and then KO Sports before that uh, that announcement was made official. They said that that report was false and that David Ludwig did not accept any role with the Coyotes. And then they were proven wrong not much long after because it was revealed that Ludwig did, in fact, accept a role with the Coyotes organization. And he was named director of hockey operations plus salary cap compliance. And Frank Saravelli once again shared that tweet saying, hey, don't say that my information is wrong because you guys have been wrong before. Now, whose side am I going to take in this case? Well, I'm leaning towards Saravelli because once again, KO Sports has been wrong before. And Saravelli brought the receipts and was and he was able to say, hey, remember the last time you said that my reports were false? So I'm going to say that even if Gibson didn't say those comments, I'm sure he's not too happy with the Anaheim Ducks organization because let's face it, they're not really giving him good treatment because he is a good goalie. He's anywhere from average to good. He's not spectacular, but the defense in front of him is not all that great. And we'll talk about that momentarily. So I'm sure Gibson, he's 29 years of age. I'm sure he wants to be put into a better situation to win and possibly in, inflate his stats just a little bit more. Because once again, it's a little unfair that he's doing his best with the Ducks organization. And unfortunately, they don't have the defense in front of them to try to help him out. And it's and it doesn't help the fact that it seems like the Ducks are in rebuilding purgatory, despite having someone like Trevor Zegras on your roster and being in the lottery the last few years, it doesn't seem like the light is showing at the end of the tunnel. But let's talk about John Gibson, his stats with the Anaheim Ducks, and would I want him added to this roster? Like, would I want the Devils to pursue him? Because a lot of people are pushing for a fact saying that maybe the Devils should get another goalie and possibly move on from VTech Vanacek. So this past season with the Ducks, Gibson appeared in 53 games, he had a win-loss record of 14-31-8. and eight. It's worth mentioning that Gibson led the league in losses. However, once again, he didn't really have a good defense in front of him, and we'll talk about that in a moment. He had a goals against average of 3.99 and a save percentage of 899. Now, here's the thing. Gibson does have a pretty good track history. He's appeared in three All-Star games. He led the NHL in wins with 31 back during the 2017-2018 season. He won the Jennings Trophy back in 2016, but he's led the league in losses three times the last few years. So he led it during the 2019-2020 season with 26. He led it during the 2021-56 game COVID season with 19. And just this past season, like I said, he led it once again with 31. Now, he has faced a lot of shots because he actually was second in the league in shots against. So he saw 1,983 shots. So once again, you could just say that the defense in front of him wasn't all that good. He also led the league in goals against with 200. So that's something that people are taking into consideration. But if we look at his track history and what he's been able to do, once more, it's pretty respectable. If we go back to the 2021 COVID shortened year, yes, he led the league with 19 losses. He had nine wins, but he had a goals against average of 2.98 and a save percentage of 903. Once again, nothing spectacular, but Go back just a couple more years, 2018, 2019, he had a goals against average of 2.84 and a save percentage of 9.17. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that Gibson is still a good goalie, but maybe the circumstance that he's in isn't really helping him. And that's maybe one of the reasons why he does want out of the Ducks organization. Once again, Sarah Belli reported it, but the agency that represents Gibson is saying that's false. But I still think that Gibson wants to be put into a better position. So I talked to my colleagues over at Pucks and Pitchforks. I said, is it possible to get someone like Gibson? Because Gibson originally signed an eight-year, $51.2 million deal. So he signed to this year. He won't become an unrestricted free agent until after the 2026-2027 season. He's being paid annually about $6.4 million. So 
if the Devils were to pursue him, it's a bit of a commitment. And I guess theoretically you could say he's cheaper than Connor Hellebuck because once Hellebuck is an unrestricted free agent at the conclusion of the season, rumors are saying that Hellebuck is going to ask for about $9 million. And that's one of the reasons why I said steer clear of Hellebuck despite him having a good track history. So once again, talked with my buddies over at Pucks and Pitchforks. They said it is possible, but you're going to have to include Vitek Vanacek in that sort of ordeal. Okay. I guess the main question is, where would he slide in if he was hypothetically traded to the Devils organization? I'll talk about as to whether or not the Devils should go through with it in the third and final segment. But obviously, if we're trading away uh, Vitek Vanacek to the Ducks in exchange for Gibson, Gibson would become the starting goalie for the Devils if, in that sort of circumstance. Because the only scenario in which Gibson does come to the Devils is if Vanacek is dealt away in that sort of trade package. Now, that is a little risky considering the fact that his numbers aren't really all that spectacular, but I talked about the circumstance. So how does this outweigh each other? Where do I lean? Well, that's quite the compelling talking point. But if I had to make a decision, I would say don't get John Gibson because in my opinion, and I've seen a lot of people respond to this sort of uh, discussion on Twitter. I think Gibson is anywhere from he could be good to mediocre, but I don't think it's worth it to trade VTech Vancheck for his services because does Gibson really make the Devils all that much better? Because I talked about his track history and it's really good, but I don't think Gibson is the goalie that a lot of people have in mind to help take the Devils organization to the next level. Because when we're looking at Vancheck, Vancheck was able to have 30 plus wins during the regular season. I get it. He crashed and burned during the playoffs, and that is inexcusable. But the fact of the matter is that Vanacek still had a really good season in net for the Devils, and he was one of the reasons why the Devils were able to have such a historical season. So when we're talking about playoff performances, yes, Vanacek did not perform all that well, but there are a lot of other players that did not step up their games. And this is something I'm trying to hammer home, which is we can't just hold that over Vanacek's head because, like I just said, a lot of his other teammates didn't exactly step up their games come playoff time, and that was to be expected. The Devils, for the most part, were very inexperienced during the playoffs, and it sometimes you got to fall down before you succeed, and the Devils fell flat on their face in round two against the Carolina Hurricanes. It was a humbling experience, and now come next year, I think they're going to be more ready. They're going to be more prepared, so I think I am still hung on the fact that Vancheck should remain with the Devils organization and trading for someone like Gibson – I just don't think it's going to make them all that much better. And plus, we need to look at the salary situation, which is Gibson is being paid annually $6.4 million. And you need to monitor the fact that there are a lot of other Devils players that are assigned to lengthy extensions. And I don't want the Devils to get to a point where it's just like they have so much uh, contract extensions up to their eyeballs that it's hard to like wiggle out these these financial room or it puts them into a very vulnerable position i'm not a mathematician but I, i'm just going based on what i'm observing and while it is possible to get gibson i just don't think it's going to be worth it in the long haul and when we're looking at the goalie situation i think james nichols said it best in one of his recent tweets he said i believe the reality of the new jersey devils goaltending situation is that they believe in banachek for good reason and also believe that schmidt needs to marinate a little longer in the ahl spurging on hellebuck didn't make sense to me at his price point we'll see how this shakes out and i think the same could be said for gibson i think nichols hit the nail on the head which is like the devils don't need to go all out for a goalie because they already have a young up-and-coming goalie that proved to be quite nice especially during the playoffs in akira schmidt and for vitek banachek he had a historical showing during the regular season so I think you could still develop Vanacek into something a little bit more. And at least you still have that security for the next couple of years with Vanacek and Schmidt uh, might come a little cheaper. And this is the final uh, year of his entry level contract. So getting John Gibson, especially trading away Vanacek, I don't think that makes the Devils any better. And plus, it's like I've been saying, the Devils should be focusing on trying to find a backup goalie, a cheap backup goalie, someone with experience, somebody, because if you want uh, Schmid to marinate him a little bit longer, similar to what James Nichols said, I'm okay with that. But at the same time, I do want someone steady behind Vanacek because in case Vanacek does hit that slump, you have someone to back him up. 
But trading away Banachek, in my eyes, it doesn't really make that much sense. Now, if Devils were in a win-now circumstance, similar to what I said about Connor Hellebuck, then by all means, make that trade because you can use the one-year rental to possibly win uh, the cup because it's your last opportunity. But the Devils don't need to get greedy here. And it goes for Gibson. It goes for Hellebuck, which is I'm not trying to condescend uh, Gibson in any which sort of way. And I understand that the circumstance doesn't really fall into his favor. But trading away Vanacek, in my eyes, I don't think that makes sense in that sort of aspect. So if you think Gibson is a better goalie over Vanacek, OK, I, 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 I'm sure you guys got your reasons. But for me, I'm perfectly content with having Vanacek on this roster. But that's just my opinion. So I think the Devils should stick to what they got right now. And if there is a goalie on the open market that's a, under the radar and can serve as either a backup or a third string, then go after it. But those are my thoughts on the matter. What do you guys think about John Gibson? Would you want him to be traded to the Devils organization? And if you were to hypothetically trade Vitek Vancheck for Gibson, would you be okay with that? So I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts because remember, the contract situation makes it a little bit different compared to someone like Hellebuck. Now, once again, I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts, so leave a comment down below if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening on podcast streaming service, hit me up on my personal Twitter page at TreyMatt4 or the show's Twitter page at Locked On Devils. As for today's episode, that's all the time I have for you, so continue to stay safe. Have a wonderful day, New Jersey. Go Devils. I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Thanks for listening once again.